So uh, the secrets, mysteries, some of the big questions around Pesach. So we can talk about a, few, a lot of things. We're not going to have time for everything. So we're going to start with, uh, I want to start with the four cups of wine. And then we'll talk maybe about the matzah and some other things. What did I put on the list? I, and then maybe selling chametz, which maybe we'll get to at the end. That's another juicy, <laughs> juicy topic. Uh, well, let's start with the wine. So drinking the four cups of wine. What is that all about? Where did that come from? Or, and then pouring a fifth, but then not drinking it. That's for Eliyahu. Four or five. For Eliyahu, yeah. Where did that come from? Why do we pour a fifth cup for Eliyahu? What does he have to do with anything here? Right. Is there a significant... Uh, the four phrases of Geula. Four or five phrases of Geula. Ken, is there a significance yeah. to the number four in Passover? Four brothers, four yeah. cups, yeah. Yeah, there is lots of fours. You see four questions and yeah, four this and four that. There's a lot of fours. So we're always, numbers are always interesting. What does the four mean? What does the five mean? So the classic answer is that there's four expressions of Geula, like the way the Torah describes how God took us out of Egypt. Lachen, that's the, the Pasuk, is, it says, Ani Hashem, ve'otzeti etchem mitachat sivlot mitzrayim. So, he sa- so the, there's four verbs that he used. He says, ve'otzeti etchem, right? Ve'hitzalti etchem, okay? Ve'ga'alti etchem, and then, ve'lakachti etchem lila'am. Okay, so... Four expressions that I took you, I take, took you out, all these expressions. But then there's also a fifth expression that comes later that says, I brought you to my land. So that the question is, are there like four expressions of Geula, of how God saved us, or five? Because there's four, but then there's also a fifth that he took us, brought, brought us to this holy land. So why would we not include that one? We include the first four how God saved us and took us out of Egypt, but why not include the one where he brought us to Israel? Well, because most of us are not in Israel right now. So then there's a debate. Should we drink that? So that generation, the Exodus generation, he brought them to Israel, although really most of them didn't make it. But for us, if we're not in Israel, should we be drinking that fifth cup? Because we're still not there. So the idea is that the Geula, like the redemption is not complete yet. Right? We're still kind of in it. We're still very much in exile and in so servitude. Shall bring the fifth cup? No, no, because they're also not. They're also still not in complete freedom. They're not in exile, but also we don't have a, a Beit Hamikdash. We don't have a temple. We don't have the Davidic dynasty, like the Jewish government in power, and uh, we're not all there. And you know, it's still this, the world is still pretty much the same. Of, of, it's not a perfect world yet that was prophesied. So we're not at the fifth stage. And so you leave a cup for Eliyahu. What does he have to do with it? What does Eliyahu have to do with the Gilead? Right, because he's the one that's supposed to announce the coming of Mashiach. He comes before Mashiach, right? And announces. And why do you need him to come before Mashiach? That's the bigger question. So we need to get ready. True, Is we need to get ready. He's going he can, he's gonna to say who he, why, why else? He can identify Mashiach, perhaps. Eliyahu. Why do you need Eliyahu to come? Is the question why him or why do you need anyone? Let's say, but why do you need anybody, let's say? Because anybody, everybody, anybody could just say, I am Mashiach. Right. Do you, need, do you need someone to... Believe it or not, I just got an email from somebody telling me that he's Mashiach. And that I should... <laughs> I'm not even joking. And I get them like periodically. There's so many people that think they're Mashiach. Huh? You should meet him. You, you should bring him on. Oh, pff, many. Yeah. No, we had a guy walk here into Shul that thought he was both Jesus and Muhammad. Like I literally. Jesus or the guy that came here, like a few months ago, he fully came in here thinking, he's like, I'm like, what's your name? He's like, Isa, Muhammad. I'm like, which one? Are you Jesus or Muhammad? He's like, I'm both. <laughs> he's like, I'm here to save everybody. The Jews, the Christians, the Muslims. But, but why do we, why do you need a prophet to come and bring the Messiah? Why can't the Messiah just come on his own? What, what does the Mashiach mean? No, no, no. He, needs to he needs to be anointed, right? Yeah. So you need a prophet to anoint. The, you, for that same reason, you can't just come and say, "Hey, I'm, I'm the Messiah." Okay. <laughs> That's a better question. How will we know? Good, good question. I, don't know. I mean, it's it has to be Eliyahu because he never died, right? He's the only prophet that the Torah says that God took him up to heaven, alive, and that's why we can expect him to return. So the age of prophecy is over. We don't expect any prophets to arise now. So we need Eliyahu to come back because he's the only prophet that never died. So he's around still somewhere. 
And then he would prepare the anointing oil, which is a special recipe, and then he could anoint Mashiach, which literally means the anointed one. Right? So you could identify him and anoint him, and then we'd know who it is, and you need a prophet. Right? So that's the whole idea of leaving a fifth cup for Eliyahu. There's also a whole other debate about drinking four or five cups of wine that's actually more practical. And of course, there's one that has to do with gematria and numbers. So we're going to look at both. Right? It's interesting to point out that where did the Seder come from? Like actually celebrating the Seder the way we do it with all this, the wine and the story in, probably in Mishnaic times, right? The last chapter of Pesachim is where all that material seems to come from. Yeah, a lot of that material is from there. Didn't have to sure. do with them in Egypt before they left? For sure, since Egypt, there's been this mitzvah to talk about on the Pesach night, the slaughter, the Koban Pesach, the, the sheep, and teach your son about what happened, for sure. But in terms of like this exact arrangement of how it's done today. Right, 2,000 years ago. From where? Where did this innovation suddenly come from? Maybe. So there's an idea, which again is very controversial, that you won't hear in many places today, that it was actually adopted from the Greeks, or adapted from the Greeks, because the Greeks had a type of celebration called a symposium, where they would get together, and they had like rules of how to do a symposium. They would commemorate their great victories and tell stories about their history, these oral stories of the Greek, ancient Greeks. And if you look at what how the ancient Greek philosophers described doing a proper symposium, you had to lie down, you had to lean, right? And you had to tell all these stories about our ancient heroes. And you had to drink several cups of wine. And the f Greek philosophers would debate how much. Three cups, four cups, five cups. And they would say, if you drink more than four, then you're an alcoholic. Right? That's too much. Right? And so it's a very controversial idea. Wait, what? We got it from the Greeks? I thought we defeated the Greeks on Hanukkah, right? I thought we were all like anti-Greek. But well, we actually... Would that, would that been before the Bethany or after the during, during, during the Second Temple era. Okay. So like if you think about the golden age of Greece, like when Greece really became a big deal, that goes at the same time as the Second Temple era. They overlap. The Second Temple during era for time us. Came up this, this right. So that's when the Seder, the Seder as we know it came about. And we know the Greeks used to do something very similar. And we know there was a lot of interaction between Jews and Greeks at the time. Uh, every page of Gemara has a Greek word in it. So that we don't even realize, we don't even think about. Sanhedrin is a Greek word, right? Even in the Seder, there's all these Greek words. Afikoman, what does that even mean? Afikoman's a Greek word, right? Karpas, you know what karpas means in Greek? It means vegetable, literally. <laughs> it's a Greek, that's what the karpas is. It's a vegetable, right? It's a Greek word. But the word karpas appears once in Tanakh. Where? Who remembers? Like yeah, in Megillat Estel, right? He had Chul and Kalpas and Tchelet, different fabrics that he mentions that Achashverosh hung up in his party. The, he decorated, it says, with Chul and Kalpas and Tchelet. So Kalpas is a fabric. So we might as well talk about that since we're already on it. What do you do with the Kalpas? You dip, you dip it in salt. salt water or vinegar. vinegar, right? So red wine vinegar. What was the whole idea of dipping karpas? If you think about, think about. No, I think the original idea I think was the coat of Joseph. Good, all right? So karpas is a fabric; it's a coat. So oh. dipping it in red wine vinegar is supposed to commemorate the brothers taking the coat of Yosef and wow. dipping it in blood started, and showing it to their started, father. Started the whole thing. Right? And that's how the whole thing started, right? Why would we want to commemorate that? Because that's how they got down to Egypt, right? They, the, the brother got sold, he came down to Egypt, and then they ended up there, and then they became slaves. So it all actually started with that story of Yosef. So the karpas, karpas on a deep level is actually supposed to symbolize that whole thing with the brothers and Yosef and how they got down but to yeah, Egypt. Karpas right? also means vegetable. And also, practically speaking, you're not dipping fabric in red wine vinegar, you're dipping a vegetable because literally, karpas means vegetable in Greek. So 2,000 years ago, Jews spoke Greek. Right? What else? Because they were part of that. I remember what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the Eastern Roman Empire, which spoke Greek. The Eastern half of the Roman Empire always spoke Greek. The Western half spoke Latin. And so they spoke Greek. And if you look at our sages, look at how many of them have Greek names. Alexander. Many. Look in the Gemara. Almost every other page is a Greek name. Yeah. 
Papa, Sumchus, uh, Rabbi Alexandri, every, so many, there's Yanais, there's all kinds of names. Uh, Aftalion is also, uh, comes from uh, the Greeks. And, and Josephus actually mentions a lot of these names. Aftalion, Patolian, he calls them Patolian, it's a Greek name. So many Greek names uh, in uh, the Talmud and Greek words on almost every page. So that's comforting. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, listen. Yeah, but you, can, you can corroborate, yeah. or not, or you can, you, you can oppose that idea just looking through Tanakh to see what were the, what were the customs, that ones that mention a, a Pesach celebration and see what they did, or not. Right. I mean, the Tanakh doesn't really mention Pesach Seders anywhere, yeah, right? Right, they don't mention Seders. So you can't you can really... Celebrations. Now, you can argue the other way. You can argue that we had it first and the Greeks got the symposium from us. Right. Why not? Maybe we had it. We were older. There's no doubt about that. The Exodus would have been long before when the Greeks were just starting out. So, and there is a lot of things that the Greeks got from us. Tons. We, we got from each other. The Greeks got perhaps even more than what we took from them. They took from us. And their whole, even their whole ancient history and their legends and their f mythical founders. If you look at their names, their names from the Tanakh, right? Like Yavan. Who's Yavan? In Greece, yeah. And he, Yavan appears in the Torah, right? The Greeks believe that they're one of their kind of mythical forefathers is Ion. Ionia, the Ionic, uh, Ionia is that region of ancient Greece. Ion is Yavan, it's the same thing. And we say that Yavan came from who? Who's like their, going back to Noah ancestor, yeah. is Yefet, right? The Greeks are always associated with Yefet. According to the Greeks, who is also one of their mythical founders, one of their first? Yapetus. It's the same thing as Yefet. Right. It's literally the same. And two of their other founders are called Cadmus and Danaeus. So there's a great book about this called uh, Was Achilles a Jew? Also. But Cadmus and Danaeus, some people say, just goes directly to the tribe of Dan, to Kedem and Dan. These are like Hebrew names. And these were, and they actually claim, according to some of their legends, that their ancestors came from Egypt. They, so some people argue that they were Israelites that escaped Egypt and went to Greece. And a lot of their, there's another great book called The Eighth Day by Samuel Kerinsky, where he points out that a lot of what we associate as Greek architecture and Greek columns was actually now been discovered in Israel even before. Right? So they, had, they took a lot from us. One of the Greek philosophers, Numenius, he actually said, who was Plato if not Moses speaking Greek? That's what he said. Because a lot of the ideas that they had, Plato, Aristotle, the, they, where do they get these ideas? A lot of them were already mentioned in the Tanakh. A lot of the same ideas you see in Mishle, in the words of King Solomon, and all over in Tehilim, right? which is no doubt that came before that. So they also took tons from us. Right? There's a great uh, historical document, which is from a Spartan king. And the king of Sparta says that us and you, it's a letter to the Maccabees, that we're brothers, that we're both from the stock of Abraham, that the Spartans also thought that they're from Abraham. And Sparta has also a lot in common with ancient Israel. Uh, if you look into it, we're not going to get into it now, but if you look into it, you'll see Sparta had a lot in common uh, with ancient Israelite culture. I mean, other than the killing babies and the idolatry and yeah. a lot of that, that. like mm -hmm. ruthlessness. Uh, so there is a lot in common there that even the, some of the Spartans believe that they come from Abraham in some way. And they were allies, by the way. When it comes to Hanukkah, people have this wrong idea that the Jews fought the Greeks. But that's not what they fought. They fought the Syrian Greeks. They fought one small group of Greeks. The Spartans actually supported them. The Maccabees and the Spartans were allies. And the, Egypt, and the Egyptian Greeks also helped to arm the Jews because the Egyptian Greeks and the Syrian Greeks constantly fought each other. So were they all considered Hellenics? Yeah, they were all part of that, but they were different empires and, and f constantly fighting each other. And so Israel belonged to the Egyptian Greeks, and then the Syrian Greeks took it over. And then that sets the stage for the Hanukkah story. So the Egyptian Greeks also helped the Jews against the Syrian Greeks. And Rome also was an ally of Israel at the time. So eventually Rome would go on to destroy Israel and destroy the temple. But originally we started off as friends, and they were actually allies with the Maccabees. They helped, and later we called them in to settle a civil war between the Maccabees, whatever. Okay, back to the four cups. So we have four cups, five cups. So our sages also debate, well, how much should you drink? Four or five. And so practically also, you want to drink enough 
to get into the right state of mind, but you drink too much, you're an alcoholic. So five's too much. Four is a good number. And remember, why do you want to drink wine? The whole idea of nichnas yain yetzasod, which has kind of two meanings. One is you drink wine and you get a little too loose and you might release, reveal your own secrets. But also, nichnas yain yetzasod means if you drink wine, you can get down to a deeper level and start understanding on, a, on the sod level, on the secret level of Torah. You remember there's four levels, right? Pshat, remez, drash, sod. So when you go down to the pardes, down to the sod level, so you drink a little bit of wine to get into that right state of mind. Take away some of your mental inhibitions and to like calm you down a little bit, relax, so that you can go deeper. Because the whole point is to talk about Egypt, to look into the Torah, talk about the Exodus all night long, right? That's how the Haggadah starts. Remember, how does the Haggadah start? It says that all those rabbis, Rabbi Akiva, remember Rabbi Eliezer, they all get together. And uh, Rabbi Tarfon, remember in Bnei Brak, that's how it begins, right? The Haggadah. And they all get together and they're talking about Pesach all until the morning, until their students came and said, it's time for the Shema Shel Shacharit, right? So the whole idea is to look, like to talk, stay up all night, talk Torah, learn, and go deeper. And so the wine helps you get into that deeper level. Yeah, also, <laughs> yes, also, <laughs> also. So you might even argue that the four cups of wine is like to go through the four levels of first year at Pshat, Remez, Drash, Sod. Good. Right? So you go down with four cups of wine. Okay. Now something more interesting. How much is a cup? How much are you supposed to drink a cup of wine? In so milliliters, or right? In milliliters, because we're you know the ancient Israelites used the metric system, not the <laughs> American <laughs> imperial system. So how much? About eighty-six milliliters. Yeah, like a revit is like somewhere around there, eighty-six milliliters. It's easy to remember why, <clears throat> because also good. Before. The gematria of Elokim of Hashem Aleph Lamed Hey Yud Mem is eighty-six. And that's actually associated, that name of God is associated with red wine because that name of God is the name of Dean, of judgment, of God being severe and punishing and plagues and so on. So it's associated with red wine, which is like kind of like blood. And so redness is associated with Dean, with, with Gvura, with strictness. And white wine is going to be more like Chesed and God's kindness and so on. So, but what else is 86? The Gimadri of Kos is 86, right? Kaf, Vav, Sameh, like a cup is 86. The value of a cup is 86. So it's easy to remember because the, the cup that you need to drink should be 86 mils. And so when you're at your Seder, just make sure that your, cu your cup's big enough. Some people take like shot glasses or like those little like Dollarama goblets and they're too small. They're like 30, 40, 50 mils, 60 mils. So you got to make sure. Eat, right? Yeah. Because every eat is how much you're supposed to drink. Right. The cup should be more than that. Well. Let's say 86 mils is the Ravid. Really? Yeah. Cost is 86. All right, you're supposed to drink four cups or five cups. Why would you drink five cups? So if you take 86, first of all, what's the meaning of 80? Let's, let's, like, let's get this, break this down. You have 86. So let's talk about how long were the Israelites actually in Egypt and how long were they slaves in Egypt? So they're two different things. They weren't slaves the whole time, right? They came in at first, they did really well. They were running the show as always. That tends to happen with Jews. They come to an area, they become very successful, everything's great, and then they get too successful. And then the Gentiles start saying, wait a second, wait a second, who are these people? Why are they suddenly all the like top doctors and lawyers and businessmen, something's not right here. It's gotta be a conspiracy here, right? So let's get them, you know, that's usually, that's the, basically the pattern of Jewish history for 3000 years. And that's what happened in Egypt. So they come there and they become very successful and the Egyptians want to get rid of them. And then they do. So how long, what, what's the timeline here? So let's see, let's see. What are, what are we? So good. So they were there 210 years. Okay. If you count all the genealogy of who had whose kid at what age, they were there 210 years. And of those, they were slaves for 86 years. That's all? That's it. So but it was 400 years worth of slavery in 86 years. <laughs> it was condensed. Right. It should have been 400 and it was packed into 86 years. I guess it was like Yeah. Which, why what? Which part? No, God originally told Abraham that your descendants will be, you know, slaves in a foreign land or in a foreign land for 400 years. But they weren't there for, they were there for 210 years and they were slaves for 86. 
So we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> they did. They did. They worked even harder than they needed to. There's another way to remember it because 86, if you know the ages, you have Moshe, and then Moshe is the youngest, right? So who's the older brother? Aaron and the yeah. Miriam. Miriam's the oldest. So Moshe had the Exodus was how old? 80. 80. Aaron was 83. And Miriam was 86. Which means at the Exodus, Miriam was 86. And they were slaves for 86 years. So what does that tell you? That means she was born when the slavery began. So now, why is her name Miriam? What does Miriam mean? The root is mal. Right? The bitterness, like maro, like the bitterness. So it was a bitter, double bitter. Miriam, when you add yam, means double, right? So Miriam means it was a very bitter year because they'd gotten enslaved. But that's the Hebrew meaning of Miriam. But there's also a Greek, uh, sorry, an Egyptian, <laughs> an Egyptian meaning. Miriam is also an Egyptian name. What does it mean in Egyptian? It actually means beautiful. So to all the Miriams out there, you know, it's not just, it's not just bitter. Miriam also means beautiful. And actually we have a tradition that Miriam was also called in Hebrew, in the Torah, she was called Ephrat, which also means beautiful. So she had her name, she had like a name change later. So she was also Ephrat. Yeah, good girl, like, you know. Yeah. So Miriam was 86 at the Exodus, 86 years they were slaves. Kos is 86, 86 were commemorating the slavery and all that. And then they were actually there for 210 years. So then what's the whole thing with the Torah saying they should have been there for 400 years? <clears throat> God told Abraham that you're going to be there for 400 years. Okay, so we can try to explain that away by saying, well, they should have been, but it was like too much. And there's, all, you know, they were already so low, deep in impurity. God had to take I them out. They said that they were at the lowest of impurity. Right. So it's like, right. if I don't take them out now, exactly. it's like, right. Wow. So they were already at the deepest level of impurity, at like the 49th level. And if it would have been one more, it would have been finished. So God had to take them out. But this is the craziest thing, because in the Torah, it actually then says when they came out of Egypt, this is the Pasuk, which is just dry, it throws everything out. This is the biggest mystery ever. And the settlement of the children of Israel, that they were living, settled in Egypt, 30 years, and 400 years, 430 years. That is five times 86. That's good math. <laughs> you already jumped to the conclusion. <laughs> so you have five cups of wine that you pour. Each one's 86. That's 430. But the Torah is telling you that they lived in Egypt 430 years. And there's no way to w interpret out of this. Because it clearly says Moshev Bnei Yisrael. That they were living there. And even if you would have wanted to say Moshev means something else, then the Torah reiterates, Asher Yashvu B'Mitzrayim. Just so you're sure that they were literally there for 130 well, years. It has two meanings, really. Okay. In Mitzrayim, there's a, there's a, uh, like a mental state of being True. in Mitzrayim and being yeah. like enslaved in your mind, whatever. Right. That's, the, that's the current true. representation well, of Mitzrayim. No, it's true also. It's true. There is a metaphorical Mitzrayim. But what do we make what with this passage? Abraham did, yeah. Right. Abraham so did, Egypt. for sure. Yeah. But they didn't stay too long, did they? They didn't, yeah. So you have 430 years. Here it says Bnei Israel, right? So like literally the children of Israel. So not Abraham. The children of Yaakov. The children of Israel were in Egypt 430 years. That's a very problematic passage. But is it, what does it say? 30, then 400? Like it's not, is it, is it, are we sure that the number is 430? Or is this one of your, uh, you know, like... It's not, again, I'm not just the pshat. It says 30 shana, 430 years. Right? Why are we saying 200? Because if you count the genealogies, like Levi went down, his son, Kehat, Amram, Moshe, or whatever, like you add it up, it looks like it's 210 years. Right? And then there's like a, like a hint to that because Yaakov, when he told the children to go down to Egypt, he said, Radu. Reduk descend to Egypt, and the gematria of Redu is 210 also. That like they descended for 210 years. So when you add up the years, it's 210. But then the Torah says it's 430. And, and then God told when, Abraham 400. If three numbers. When does it say that? Like, when, when they came out of Egypt. This is when it says what, at, the oh, at the Exodus. Yeah, so it says they came out of Egypt. And it's telling you, Umoshav Bnei Yisrael. And how long were they there? 430 years. What's the conclusion here? How do we go around all this? There's, there's a couple of ways to make sense of this. If we look at the, just the pshat, 
Like, let's just forget all tradition. Forget gematria. Forget all that. Leave that aside. Let's say we're reading the Torah just as pshat. Like, I'm picking it up as a novel. And I'm reading it as a novel. God told Abraham, your descendants will be slaves for 400 years. Or will be there for 400 years in a foreign land. So, again, I'm reading this as a novel. I don't know anything. I don't know Rashi. I don't know. Let's, let's put that aside for a second. I'm assuming that they're going to be there for 400 years, right? So I'm reading the story. The children of Israel are there. They're complaining that they've been there so long. They've already lost hope that they're going to be redeemed. Right? And they cry out to God. And then God says, okay, yeah, I know it's time. And then all these events happen. And then they come out of Egypt. And I read what it says. And the Torah is telling me that they were there for 430 years. Everything makes per perfect sense here, right? If I read it just as a pshat novel, it makes perfect sense. God told Abraham they'd be there for 400 years. So presumably the children knew that because they heard from their grandparents, hey, you guys are going to be here for 400 years. And they were expecting to be there for 400 years. And the 400 years passed and they're still not being saved. So what do they do? Of course, they lose hope. And now they're in like a total, that's why when Moshe comes, they don't even want to believe in him because they're like, no, forget it. The time has passed. The deadline's gone. And that's census, why, the census, well, that's, leave that aside, <laughs> leave the senses aside. But you see how on a shot level, it actually totally makes sense that they were there for four, more than 400 years. They were there over time. That's why they lost hope. That's why they didn't want to believe in Moshe originally. And then God pulled them out and it was such a big miracle. And that actually also explains, there's a very famous Midrash that the children of, of Ephraim from the tribe of Ephraim left 30 years early. Did you ever hear this Midrash? There's a very famous Midrash that a group of people from the tribe of Ephraim said, okay, 400 years is up, we're out of here. Right? And they actually left and they died in the wilderness. They ran away, whatever. They fought their way out, they ran away and they died or were killed actually. They were killed in the wilderness. Not all of them. A por portion of, uh, of the Ephraim was... Just... Exactly. And then that ties into Yechezkel. Because remember Yechezkel's vision of the dry bones. That God takes Yechezkel to the wilderness. And the, he sees the bones. And God says, can, you rev can these vo bones be revived? And, and Yechezkel says, how would I know? You know. <laughs> You're God. Right? And then God revives the bones. And our tradition is that who were these people that God revived? They were those children of Bnei Ephraim that died in the wilderness way back when. And that's actually one of the sources of Tchiat HaMetim. Because the Torah doesn't explicitly tell us anywhere that there will be a resurrection of the dead. That's one of the places where we see that there's evidence for a future resurrection. That all the dead will come back to life. So actually to read it this way, as 400 and 430, it actually follows really nicely. And it explains a lot of other Midrashim together. But when we actually count it, it doesn't add up, right? It should be only 210 years. Unless you're going to say that we're missing some generations over there. And, but we can't accept that because we're going to assume that it's exactly what the generations are listed. It was Levi and Kehat and Amram and Moshe. So it must be 210 years. So then how do we make sense of this then? Why do we have to assume that, that it's an exact genealogy? There are instances where it's not. It's true. And, and it skips gene, gene. So we could just say that it's probably maybe skipped a couple of generations. But then that kind of messes up a lot of other things, like, like Moshe's the 26th generation. And we like that number because 26 is Hashem. So like Moshe is the 26th generation from Adam. Okay, but, you the, but, that, but, that, but that's so that it fits some, some abstract thing where here you have a very concrete number. True, and true. Happy. Yeah, so I think you can read it very much as Pshat. The, the other problem with that though, if you accept that number, then the year we're in now is not 5782. The year is already like 6,000 and you're 220 years ahead. We're at 6,000 already. Right? So, sorry, if you accept which number the 400? If you're going to accept that the Israelites were actually there not 210 years, but 430, that means you have to add 220 years to our chronology, which means that we're not in 5782. That means we're already in 6,002. <laughs> exactly. Here. <laughs> Yeah. Us some brain right. here. Yeah. So see, as I said, it's going to be the mysteries of Pesach. <clears throat> yeah. But let's see, how else can we explain 430 years? So if you look at how the, that Pasuk continues, which I didn't oh. copy. Uh, so it says, <laughs> the next verse. Huh? It's an right, so that's exactly it. So the next verse says, <laughs> And it was after 430 years. That, on that particular day, Yitz'u, 
who came out of Egypt? Kol Tzivot Hashem. Meretz Mitzrayim. Wait, what? What does that have to do with anything? Tzivot Hashem, the armies of the legions of God. When we talk about Tzivot Hashem, who are we referring to? Always to the angels. The Tzivot Hashem are the angels, right? God's, God's angels. Right. But it says Yeah. So now, at first it says Moshe Bnei Yisrael, and then the very next verse then says, Ba'im shloshim shana, at the end of 430 years, who came out of Egypt? The Tzivot Hashem. The angels of God. No. So what happened was, the angels had to come there before. Why? To set the stage for all these events, right? To make, to prepare everything that had to happen in Egypt that sequence of events to set the events in motion, they came earlier. And if you count, what is 430 years before the Exodus? That's when Avraham was 70 years old. And that's when God was all, you know, when God was grooming Avraham to start his mission. So he already sent right? the angels. Right. Okay. So just as Avraham was coming and becoming this new leader, right? Parashat Lech Lecha begins when he's 75 years old. And at that point, he already made souls, it said. So just as Avram was becoming this great leader, God already sent angels to Egypt to set all the events in motion. There are in this time already that it's going to happen. Right. Right? Yeah. So where's the free will? There's still free will. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> There's still free will. Because, gotta, I because you know what it is? I got a hard time with that. Because you choose, let's say, let me give you an analogy. Yeah. Let's say I go ahead 40 years into the future and I see what you did in your life, right? And I come back here and I know what you're going to do, but my knowing what you're going to do in the next 40 years, does that have any impact on your free will? No, because I'm going to do what's been already uh, no, forget predetermined. That. Forget, there's no predetermination. I built a time machine. I go ahead 40 years. I can already see what you're going to do now. You're going to do this, oh, this, this, whatever. Up, it's what, what you end up doing. Yeah. What, what well, sure. And now I come back in time, and I know that next week you're going to go wherever. Does that affect, does that have any influence on your free will? No. I don't even tell you what you're going to do. You're going to go and do what you need and, to do. And I'm going right? to do it. Exactly. But I'm going to do only what's been predetermined. Maybe I'm not. Going to do anything no, else. maybe not. And I'll tell you what, the, what, what it is. It's yeah. the fact that I've just, I'm not limited by time. I went into the future. Because we have to break free from thinking about time as like pres past, present, future. Because it's not like that at all. Right? Time is happening simultaneously. Past, present, and future are actually one. And that's part of relativity theory. It's part of time dilation. Time is just, it's not what we think. Right? Time is happening simultaneously. And that's what Hashem really means. Right? The Zohar says very famously, Yud Hei Vav Hei, Ayahu Ve'ihiyeh. It's all at the same time. For God, past, present, and future is the same. So it's God, is, it's like a triangle. Understand that. Because we, we cannot experience this. It's very difficult. Right. So that's why we, we, it seems like we, don't, we might not have free will. But you are making a choice. And the, way that, the reason that God knows, because he's there at the same time, simultaneously. Because God's not bound by time. So to you, it might, think, it might seem like God already knows what I'm going to choose. So how can I have free will? Well, God only knows because he's there when you're making that choice. And he's here now. And he's here 500 years ago. And so that's all. It's, just, it's a different way of thinking about time. So the angels come out after 430 years. And this goes back to when Abraham, God already gets Abraham ready. He's getting Egypt ready. We also have to get souls ready because all these souls have to be born in Egypt, right? So even when it says here, if you're wondering, well, it says Moshev Bnei Yisrael, it could be referring to the souls of Israel that were already in there, in Egypt from that time, from 430 years ago. And the Arizal talks about the souls that were reincarnated into the Israelites and who they were and why they had to be reincarnated. So the souls of the Israelites were, could also have been there, even though physically, bodily, they were only there for 210 years. Spiritually, they were there for 430, and God's angels were there for 430. And to come back to the cups of wine, you have five cups that you pour, 86 per cup. 86 times five is 430. So each cup commemorates the 86 years of slavery that they were physically there and then all together you have the whole 430 year sequence okay let's jump ahead okay let's talk about um dro dropping the wine since we're already on wine let's finish with the wine we have this thing where we drop spill a drop for the plagues and then there's the acronym what's the acronym 
a dash, be'achav, right? So it's stand dam, tzfardea, kinim, right? Datzach, and then arov, datzach. Arov, dever, atash, be'achav, right? So it stands, it's an acronym, right? It's an acronym for all of the, the plagues, and you spill one drop, and all this thing. So what is, this, what is the whole idea? If you think about the plagues, we often like don't think about what was the actual purpose of these particular plagues. Why make the Nile into blood? What's with the frogs? What's with the lice? Why is that necessary? Each of these things. Why those things and not something else? Well, the Nile I can think because water is life, like, right? Because right. they're life, like right. fish probably. Yes, exactly. And then they, sure. they worship the water. The Nile. Exactly. And so God wanted to, and we say this in the Agadah, that God struck down Elohei Him, that God struck down their gods, their false gods that they believed in, right? God struck them down. So if you actually look at the 10 plagues, each one was targeted at one of the main Egyptian gods. So the first one was the Nile. The Nile was, they worshiped the Nile. It was one of their gods. It was a fish god, it's called Anuket. And I mean, generally we're not supposed to say the names of idols, but since these idols are already obliterated and nobody worships them, it's not an issue anymore. It's just historical at this point. So it was against showing them that I'm like literally killing your life force. I'm killing your Nile God, your false Nile deity. And the next one, the frog. The Egyptians had a frog god. Who was the frog god in Egypt? Yeah, they had a god for everything. Huh? Kermit the frog. <laughs> yeah, so it was the god of fertility because frogs multiply, reproduce very quickly. So the, their god of fertility called he uh, Heket, the frog headed god. And so what did God do? Using the fertility of the frog, mida keneged mida, he punished them with its fertility. So many frogs that it was coming out of their ears and their ovens and they're all over the place. And so it's, again, like everything's measure for measure and so on. And then the third plague was lice. And how did the lice come about? You remember how the lice? From the sand, right? They struck the ground and the ground turned to lice. Why? The Egyptians also worshipped their soil. Actually, the Egyptians, anybody know what the Egyptians called themselves? We call them Egypt, which is from the Greek, Egyptus. But what did they call themselves? What did they refer to their land as? They called themselves Kemet. That, Kemet. Kemet. That was the name of Egypt in Egypt, was Kemet. Kemet means black earth. They worship their rich black soil, their dark soil. The Nile and the soil that it would, you know, irrigate. It wasn't sandy, but no, I mean, the sand is outside. Like Egypt is very narrow, right? That's what Mitzrayim means. What's Mitzrayim? It means narrows. Because Egypt is a very narrow empire. It's all basically, it runs along the Nile. Because if you go a little bit farther away, it's all sand, right? So the whole empire was built. All the cities are basically within pretty short distance from the Nile. So it's a narrow empire. And so the actual, around the Nile, the soil is very rich. And so they worshipped also the soil, and they had the god Jeb, the god of the earth. And then so Moshe specifically. Kemet is the Egyptian. Kemet is the name for the country, in, based in on the Egyptian soil. Language. Yeah, in right. Egyptian language. Yeah, and, and Jeb any, is the any, god. Any... Uh, Moshe, they, Aaron actually struck the earth, and the sand turned into lice, right? And then again, it's like the earth itself is attacking them. So they basically went one after the other, taking and, apart. I also remember reading like the, the lice, it was something that... They, their magicians can make almost all of these things because they were like bigger, but there's something so small that right. their magicians... There's an idea that black magic doesn't work on such small entities. Right. Yeah. And so when this happened, they said, wow, it's by Elohim. This is this must be the finger of God. Yeah. Because that's already an illusion that they couldn't replicate, you right. know, or they couldn't make the illusion for this. Right? So then if you keep going, like every plague, you can go on Wikipedia after and look at Egyptian gods and see how they were all struck down, right? The animals, devil, and everything, one after all their animal-headed gods and so on. And uh, the, the ninth plague, very famous, blot out the sun, right? Darkness. Why? Who was their main god? The sun god, Ra. Right? Blot out the sun, no sun. And then the tenth was Pharaoh himself, right? The children, the, the dynasty, because they worshiped the pharaohs. The pharaohs were also gods on earth. So then strike down the pharaohs, the, the Beho, the firstborn who is destined to be the next king. And so even strike down the next, the, uh, the, the heir to the throne. Firstborn, not just, uh, yeah. Right, all, and including the pharaohs, right? So Pharaoh struck down that he has control over every everything, individual, everything, every family, exactly. and he can differentiate between who's the firstborn exactly. and who's not. And, and the Korban Pesach also, God said specifically, we have Shabbat HaGadol, the whole idea of Shabbat HaGadol. One of the explanations for Shabbat HaGadol is that God told them, prepare a sheep for sacrifice. 
right? And for the Egyptians, that would have been very appalling. Why? Because at that time they were worshiping the sheep. Why were they worshiping the sheep at that particular time? Because it's the month of Nisan, right? Nisan, what's the astrological... You see, like, you yeah. see, like, these dog-faced yeah. gods. And yeah, other there is a ram-headed god. There is a ram-headed god. I can even tell you the name of that, because I'm going to write about it this week. I put it somewhere. Ah, uh, there is a ram-headed god, yeah. I put his name somewhere here. Chnum, with a chaf, because it's K-H-N-U-M. Chnum. Yeah, it's the ram-headed, the sheep-headed god. No, a ram is a sheep. Yeah, a ram is a male sheep. That's right. Yeah. So they were, the astrological sign of Nisan is Aries, right? It's the sheep, the ram. So that was the time to worship the sheep. And so they were specifically slaughtering the sheep. Like, it's like we're slaughtering your God, right? So everything was like deliberate and very calculating, calculated to attack their false idolatrous beliefs. How long was all the How long? Over a year. Each one lasted roughly a month, basically. There was like a, a, a week, and then there was a break, and then there was a warning, and then, you know, so over... No, no, no. They were, yeah, they were slaves, like, with no hope for, like, 85 years. And then in the last year, like, you want the deep meaning why it had to be that many years? There is a meaning. No, like, why did they wait to complain 85 No, they were always complaining. Jews. Jews. Always <laughs> complain. They complained from before they were slaves. <laughs> and after. Yeah. And it took 85 years before yeah. God said, okay. There's a reason why they had to be slaves for 86 years. Because there's a, remember Migdal Bavel, the Tower of Bavel? So there's an idea that these were the souls reincarnated from the generation that built the tower. And that tower was built over 86 years. So their punishment spiritually was to build it as slaves. Wow. Yeah. But so I that's the, the people, the people building the Tower of Bavel were separated all over the world. And yeah, I'm talking about reincarnation. This is hundreds of years later. It's a reincarnation. Uh-huh. Yeah. They want to take over the heavens, yeah. So we think, but before, that's was like 10 generations. Remember, it goes the flood. So you have Adam, 10 generations flood. And then a few generations after the flood, about 300 years after you have the Migdal Bavel. But Avraham was born already. Avraham was there at the time. He was 48 when it was destroyed. So he was already around. Okay, let's talk about, we have a little bit of time left. You guys have energy or you're done? Okay, talk, I want to talk about selling chametz because it's one of the things that I'm, uh, I guess I should say, somewhat opposed to. Uh, and the message is... I have a lot of flour at home, man. Flour is not chametz. What? Flour is not chametz. So how do you make matzah? Exactly. From flour. So do you want to make flour is not chametz? Flour is not chametz. Raw flour is not chametz. You just put it away. It's not like there's this thing now of like filling out a form. I know, that's stupid. And supposedly somehow... You know, the chametz is all over your house or whatever, in a room in your house, and some a Gentile presumably is buying it, and then you're buying it back. Even though no money is exchanging hands from you, and you're just filling out a form, and nobody comes to your house to even check what you have and what you don't have. Right, yeah. But the there's a, there's, there's a few weeks old that you can't ignore, right? Right. So, let's see. I mean, there's a good reason why, why it exists. It, for sure. How can you keep what is sell? Sell? No. It's sell with an aleph. Yeah. Sell is starter dough. It's what? Starter dough. Do you have starter dough lying around in your house? No. You're fine. <laughs> so, so you can't have chametz and sell, right? No, because they didn't have yeast back then. You, you today have a pack of yeast. Yeah, yeast but they didn't have active dry yeast purified in machines in a factory back then, right? There was no way back then to purify yeast. They didn't have put a tablespoon of yeast and make bread. The only way back then was to have starter dough. So, oh, starter dough, right? So you have to understand something. This is the, part of the problem of being a modern individual is that we're so detached from nature. Like we just go to the store and buy yeast. You know, this is yeast. Where did it come from? So you have to remember then those days didn't have that. Wheat has yeast in it. It is impossible to get it out. It's an endosymbiotic relationship. So why do we have that? Your yeast grows into wheat. You cannot remove it. Why it is in there. And yeast, to yeast is so um, fungus in general, but yeast is so powerful. It grows into everything. It's in grapes. How do you make wine? 
you, wine will ferment naturally because it has yeast in it. You don't have to add it. It'll naturally ferment. This yeast is, grows into, again, endosymbiotically. It's living in among the cells of the fruit. Right? That's why you get any fruit. You leave it on the counter, it starts to get you. Where did that yeast come from? Right? Like, because it's already in there. Right? So fungus is already in there. Wheat also has fungus in it. So in the old days, what, to make dough that rises, right? You take your, you make flour. There's already yeast in there. You just have to mix it with water and you leave it for a long time. And oh. once it starts to get sour, you know that there's a lot of yeast there already. The natural yeast in there starts to come out, but that takes a long time. So that's starter dough? Okay. That's starter dough. You leave it for a long time. It takes, no, not months, but even in, in days, in a few days, it'll start getting sour. Probably, I don't know what's the exact amount dough? to make starter dough, to make sourdough. Right. And then it takes to have like dough that's full of yeast. And then, let's say it takes a couple of weeks, let's say, on average. And now you have the starter dough. Then, if you want to make like nice fluffy challahs, you take regular flour. You don't want to wait again two weeks. So you take a piece of the starter dough right, and you add it. That's how you would add yeast back then. It wasn't like add a tablespoon of like purified yeast. So you mix it into your batch. So okay, that's so, the idea. So, sorry, quick question. So the idea... But if somebody can, so if somebody does not sell their chametz, or, or if a certain chametz is, is in the ba'alut, in, in the, I guess, it belongs to somebody during Pesach, the concept of never being able to eat it, or that's what? Nonsense. It's not nonsense. If you have chametz that, like, that you, in a Jew's possession, and avara leva Pesach, right, then it becomes not kosher. But you have to define the chametz properly. Like, what is chametz? Again, flour is not chametz, for example. People have cans of tuna, corn, bags of rice. None of that's chametz. You don't have to sell. The only thing that's like chametz is like legitimate, like cookies, pasta, like actual bread, bagels, like things like that. That's chametz. You have to get rid of that. What about things like yeah. beer and, and... So that we have to talk about. That? that needs to be discussed. Because beer, yeah, it's chametz. Of course. Because it's fermented grain. But that's why, coming back to selling chametz, the fact that it became so widespread today, you really don't, like, you don't want to do it unless it's absolutely necessary. Right? But today it became very widespread. Why? For a good reason. Like, so let's see where it comes from. Let's, talk, let's see where it comes from. Um, the, the Mishnah says in Psachim that, that as long as you're allowed to eat the chametz, you can feed it to your beast, whatever, and you can sell it to a, a non-Jew, to a Gentile. That's the Mishnah in Psachim. So as long as you're allowed to eat it, you're allowed to sell it to a Gentile. Okay, good. Now the Gemara asks on that, why would the Mishnah even mention this? It seems pointless to mention this, right? The Gemara says right away, like it's obvious. Why would you need to mention that as long as you can eat chametz, meaning it's not Pesach yet, you can also sell it? Obviously, obviously I can sell it. Why wouldn't I not be allowed to sell it? You see the problem? So the Gemara is asking, why does the Mishnah need to even mention this? The Gemara asks, why did they mention this? Because Beit Shammai Omrim, remember we have Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. Yeah. And Beit Shammai were very strict. So Beit Shammai say, Lo imkor adam chametzo legoy, ela imken yodea bo sheikhle kodem Pesach. That, so Beit Shammai held that you're not allowed to sell chametz to a non-Jew if they're, if they're going to eat it on Pesach. Even if they're not Jewish. So like... Why? They're not, because it's like you okay. gave it to him. Because <laughs> like you were the agent of him eating chametz on Pesach. But even though he's not. Right. right. But Beit Shammai again is very stringent. They're saying you shouldn't sell it to him. If it's like Erev Pesach and you have a, bun of a bunch of bagels, you cannot give it to him because he's going to eat it tomorrow and it's already Pesach. And you were the cause of him eating chametz. <laughs> Right, so that's Shammai. We don't follow Beit Shammai. And therefore, it says, Beit, we're following, but that's why the Mishnah had to mention it, because Beit Hillel says, no, kol shashem mutar lechol, mutar limkol. That's like, whatever. As long as you can eat it, you can sell it, and who cares what he does with it? That's his, it's gone. That's it. So from here, we see that like, you, like, you can't really sell. You, have, you can only sell before, and it's gone. It's not yours. You can't, there's no like selling and buying back. But then, this is the interesting thing. There's a Tosefta, which is like an additional, it's like a side Mishnah that's not included in the Mishnah, but an additional teaching on the side that says, this is an interesting case. Israel ben Nuhri shayu ba'in besfina, if a Jew and a non-Jew are stuck on a boat together, ve'chametz be'yad Israel, and the Jew has chametz, what does he do? Mochol and Nuhri, he can sell it to the non-Jew, because they're, they're stuck on a ship. Like, there's nowhere to go, right? And he has all this chametz. Or he can give it be matana, 
וחוזר ולוקח ממנו לאחר הפסח. And then after פסח he can take it back from him, ו- but, ובלבד שייתנו לו במתנה גמורה. That only if you give it to him as like completely, like you really sell it to him, it's yours, like do whatever you want with it, or it's a gift, it's yours. After פסח, you see that he didn't use it, okay, I'll buy it back from you, why not? So how long yeah. after it was, it was this Tosefta? After the... At the same time as the Mishnah, roughly. Really? Yeah. So, but this is again in a dire situation where you're stuck on a boat. And again, your food's limited on a boat. You can't just throw it overboard because then you're gonna, you might be on the ship for another three mo- weeks or a month. You don't know. You might starve. You're not just going to get rid of the food because you might die. <laughs> so you can't just get rid of the food. So, okay, sell it to him. If he doesn't eat it after Pesach, you can buy it back from him. But it has to be like you gave it to him. And he might say, no, I don't want to sell it back to you. And that's it. And that's what the Tosefta says. Now, based on this, the Shulchan Aruch then says, You know, the, the law is that you are allowed to do it, but under very strict circumstances, right? And he says that it has to be a matanag mura blishum t'nai. Like there cannot be any conditions here. You have to give it as a gift. Like it has to be a total sale. Aval matana al manat le'achzir lo mani. But if you're giving it to him only to get it back, that doesn't work. You can't do that. Right? But look at, look at, listen to the words of the Bet Yosef. So the Shulchan Aruch is the short version of the Bet Yosef. Same person wrote it. Bet Yosef is in more detail. So he says over there that if you're doing it in order to get it back and you're not like really have an intention to like completely, it's a mechira gmura, then it's ein lecha harama gdola mizu. That this is the biggest deception ever. Like who are you lying to? And if you do that, he's actually saying that you are over al bali ra'eh u bali mitzad, that you're actually breaking both commandments. So at the time of the Shulchan Aruch, this meant Like it's a mechira gmura, you sold it away, it's his, that's it. And you have to give it to him. At the time of the Shulchan Aruch, you physically had to give it in his possession. Now, where did this begin where you can actually keep it in your possession? This began a little bit later in the time of the Bach, Rav Yoel Sirkis. And he did it because, and he explains why he allowed it, keeping it in your possession. He says, because they lived in Poland. And at that time, the main Jewish business in Poland, as he writes, was making beer. A lot of jobs for Jews were restricted and Jews were huge in beer production. So now what do you do with beer? That's fermented grain. So you say, well, I can sell it, but I can't give him my whole machinery. I can't give him my factory. So I have to sell everything, you know, the equipment, the room. So I'd like lease out the whole room. So he was the first one to actually permit without actually giving a complete sale and actually giving it over. Like I keep it in my possession, but like it's kind of yours, but like we have an understanding. So that, came out, that came from the Ashkenazi? Yeah, from Poland. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, a lot of them didn't accept it, really. Like even the Vilna Gaon, for example, he wouldn't do it. And he's like, what did, you know, so have to get rid of it. He, he allowed selling it, but not with getting it back. So Sell it. What was the tradition before this then? People didn't do it and they didn't need to do it because you just eat up what you need. Yeah. And again, most things are not chametz. Like if you have raw flour, you, it's fine. It's not chametz. No, yeah. but you have like, Right. Back then they didn't have that. Yeah. Back then. Now we do. So what do we do now? So this is what. So this is like a few tips. How how can you? Right. So what do you do? So ideally, once Purim is over, you know that I have a month to eat everything up. So like, eat up all your stores, and then after Pesach, go get new ones. Whatever you have left over that you couldn't eat. How do you what? How do you make new ones? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a different question already. But you have the flour. You have sugar, you have flour. That's it. <laughs> you don't need anything else. Right? What else do you need? Eggs, flour, uh, or sugar? Come on, let me finish with this. Let me finish. Just two minutes on tips on how to avoid selling the chametz. Like if you need to sell it, you sell it. Fine. It's allowed. It's halachically permitted. Today it's accepted. It's not a sin. We're also told it's you fine. have to trust what the rabbis are telling you to do. So right, right, right. So if you need to do it, do it. <laughs> Listen, if you need to do it, you do it, it's accepted, and so on. But if, like, for the real committed Jews, and you know how strict it is not to have chametz, like, why would you risk playing this game, right? Uh, so how do you do it? So eat up everything, whatever you have left over. If it's cookies and pasta, this stuff's cheap, right? Like, that's, like, there's no need to hold on to it. You don't have to throw it out. Go give it to a food bank. Give it to a food bank, and you do a mitzvah out of it. Oh, yeah. every year I always have a few bags. Donate it. Yeah, yeah, no, Great. So you donate what you have to a food bank. Then you do a mitzvah and it's a double mitzvah both ways. So that's what you can do that, with that. Then, if you, the, the main issue is alcohol. So very quickly, beer is chametz. But again, beer is cheap. 
Huh? Whiskey. whiskey is whiskey really chametz? That's the they question. Say it is. I don't know. It's a questionable. You won't drink it. You're not allowed to drink it. I want to know. Yeah. Why, so, why is it questionable? Tell me. Let's see. I can drink it. So I'll tell I you. No, no, no. Don't drink whiskey. No, 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 no. <laughs> Do not drink whiskey on Pesach. <laughs> why? Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. You cannot drink whiskey. I, I want to walk out yeah. here and say, hey, the rabbi no, no. says we can For drink sure. it. For sure you can't drink whiskey on Pesach. That's not the question. The question is, is whiskey certified chametz? So the, the reality is, I can give you a parallel question. Is whiskey gluten-free? Is beer gluten-free? No. Beer is not gluten-free. No, like legit beer. Beer is not gluten-free because it's fermented grain. The grains are in there. Chametz, no question. But whiskey is gluten-free. Whiskey is 100% gluten-free. Why? Because it goes through a distillation process. Distillation is a very, very refined, very, uh, very um, purified uh, chemical process. After distillation, you have basically just alcohol left. There's nothing left of the grain and none of the gluten, none of the grain. So you just have alcohol. Then they take the alcohol and they put it in the oak and the, in the barrels and the barrels give it the flavor. So there's no grain. And that's why... Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly why I'm saying you cannot drink whiskey because maybe there is something, a drop, a grain, a molecule, even though it's gluten free. Uh, the chances of something in the whiskey of being there is very small. But again, because there's a chance, we're not going to drink it because it is made from fermented grain ultimately as step one. So you cannot drink whiskey. But is it certified chametz? No, not really. All right, so you just put it away. And again, I'm not a posek, but in my opinion, scientific opinion at least, this is not whiskey. And really it's questionable. I mean, it's not chametz. Right. And um, it's of questionable status. So can you drink it? For sure, no. But is it chametz? Not really. Just put it away, cover it, hide it, whatever. You don't really have to sell it because it's not really chametz. So do not drink it, but no, you can put it away. Yeah. In vodka is like that too. Beer's a problem. Beer's chametz. But, but beer... So what do you do with beer? So last thing, and that's it. What do I do with, I always try between Purim and Pesach to drink all whatever I have, vodka, whiskey, just finish it anyway, so there's no doubt. Whenever I have bottles left over, you go to LCBO and you return them and they will take it without a receipt. They will take it. They will so, take your alcohol. They will take it. In, in but they won't. I don't know about beer. I never did beer. Beer's cheap. Like just drink it, whatever, throw it out or give it to your friend. Give it to your neighbors or whatever. So like, a why not? It, no, a oh, yeah, sealed bottle. If I have yeah. extra sealed bottles, yeah. I just take them back to the LCBO. They give me a gift yeah. card. That's it. Done. Or whatever. I have one, two bottles left over, three bottles. You take it, give it back, done. And then you don't have to sell it. That's it. So cookies and pasta, it's all cheap stuff. Like nobody's emotionally attached to this. Just give it to the food bank. You do a mitzvah. Right? You have extra beer. Like I have a bunch right now. I'm probably just going to give it to my neighbor. He likes beer. He's Polish, ironically, so <laughs> the Bach would approve. So you give it to him. He's happy. I'm happy. That's it, right? What is like? It's not. It's not expense. It's not worth keeping for your, for like fifty, forty dollars to break the mitzvah. It's not worth it. And then you don't have to do the sale. And if there's, if there's a doubt that there's a some kind of deception here or whatever, you don't even want to be a part of it. So let's just do it right and get rid of it. That's the idea. Anyways, uh, I think that's enough for tonight. Thank you very much. Chag <laughs> 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 <laughs>